Hey everybody, happy Valentine's Day. Um, I'm Nick Mikros, and this is my uh, friend and collaborator, Josh DeBonis, and I have to turn this mic on, even though my voice is really loud. Okay, uh, so three years ago, we started working on a game called Red vs. Black. We played it on Governor's Island in a shady field, and uh, we thought it was kind of cool, and that was the game that eventually became Killer Queen. Um, the history of Killer Queen has been guided by forces that sometimes seemed outside of our control. Uh, so much so that usually we don't really think of ourselves as the creators of the game as much as the stewards of a game that we love. And um, this is our story, uh, our challenges, our solutions, and our defeats and our victories, and we hope you enjoy it. So Nick and I have both been making games for a long time, but originally we both came from other disciplines outside of games. So, and we think that's one of the reasons why we work so well together. I was a musician, I studied jazz in college, and I played in bands ever since high school. And Nick studied art and art history, he was a visual artist, and he made indie comics like this, and he was always looking for ways to integrate computers with his art. And so then we met in about 2006 when we were both doing contract work for a studio here in, uh, in New York called Game Lab. Okay, so, so far we've worked on four games together, and there seem to be some common threads that run between the four games. For one thing, they're always flamboyant, and they're always full of spectacle, but they're still games. They still have rules, they have winners, and they have losers. Um, they're always social, incredibly social, and very team-based, and family-friendly, and our goal has always been to bring people together to play, and, I, and, and to have a good time. So the first game that we collaborated on was called Pitch and Pinata Pummel, and in this game, players would make pinatas out of paper mache and then fill them with um, bouncy balls and ping pong balls. And then several days later, after they dried, then we would play the game, and players would get into teams, and they'd smash the pinatas, and all the balls would go flying, and you'd have to scramble for the balls, and then you could trade in those balls for either points or for power-ups like bigger bats, extra swings, or um, the ability to take off your blindfold. And so we also have a passion, shared passion for classic video games, especially the Atari 2600. So for our next collaboration, we wanted to do something that, that reflected that. And so some of the ideas we tossed around was like projecting the game combat on the uh, floor and players dodging the tanks and their bullets. We eventually settled on making our interpretation of Pitfall, which was called Pitfall Live at the Tank. And um, it was played in Manhattan at this place called The Tank, on a stage much like this one, and where we projected uh, screens from the game on the rear wall and the floor of the stage, and uh, players would run across and have to jump over these projected logs, and there was a, a rope, an actual rope, hanging from the ceiling. They'd have to swing across over tar pits and uh, lakes and things like that. And so uh, those, we really liked those games, and for our next game, we wanted to keep the same spectacle that was in our pre previous work, but add a more uh, depth to it. And so we created this game called Killer Queen. It was a field game that was played with uh, you know, foam swords like this and uh, fun balls like that. <laughs> um, so and so we, we, we feel like we met that, that goal of keeping the spectacle uh, you know, but adding strategy to it. Okay, so at this point, we were feeling pretty good about the three games that we had created, and we decided that we were going to start touring the games a little bit. And one thing that we realized very quickly was that it's really, really, really hard to tour field games. Uh, we have to basically lug all this equipment around the country, deal with the TSA, who is constantly like, why are you bringing bats onto a plane? Um, and, uh, and, and also, traveling is expensive and time consuming. 
So we're sitting around the office and we're like, huh, we both make video games. Maybe we could take this idea of Killer Queen and bring it into a video game format. And between the two of us, we could do everything ourselves. And so that's what we decided to do. And we built the whole game ourselves. We pushed every pixel and we, uh, and we wrote every line of code. And we were so excited, we're gonna, we're gonna make this portable version. So here is this easy to transport thumb drive version of the game. <laughs> all right, so just like in all our other games, uh, we share uh, the duty of, of or, and joy of designing the game. But for Killer Queen, we had to make a video game. So we decided to divide the labor in the way that Josh would do all the audio design and the coding, and I would do all the art and the visual design. So for those of you who haven't played either game, I'm going to quickly explain both of the games at the same time, um, both Killer Queen and Killer Queen Arcade. So one player on the team, on each team, is the queen who acts as basically the quarterback of the team. And the other players are her workers. They can run around uh, and pick up food. And one way that they can win is by bringing that food back to their base and filling up their base with food. The workers can also use the food to become soldiers. And the soldiers and the queens can kill other players. And the second way that they can win is by killing the enemy queen three times. The workers are also special because they can move the snail or its analog in the field game, the bomb. And the third way to win is to bring the snail home or push the bomb to your opponent's base. Okay. So the idea for the video game was that we were going to mix the rules of Killer Queen with a lot of the mechanics from, uh, from games that we loved, including uh, the old arcade game, Joust. And so this is a very early version of the game. And uh, it, as you can see, it's, it's vertical. It's a portrait orientation. And one of the big differences between the early version was that the workers didn't jump. They actually climbed on that hex-like lattice. And uh, another thing was that you can see the snail down there. He looks a little different these days. But it's basically, uh, the snail could not only travel on the platform, but actually around the corners of the platform and the sides and upside down, etc. So you would ride it along the platform all the way to the top. And so that's actually why we chose the snail. People ask us, why a snail? That's the reason. Um, and uh, workers to soldiers uh, was always a problem for us in the video game. And up there, see those square boxes with little tiny swords in them? You would basically uh, bring the swords back up there and the queen would bless them. It was very complicated. This is the current version of the game. Um, so the first big thing is that uh, workers jump now, right? So uh, because they jump and because there's a lot of platforming, uh, that led us to go to a horizontal orientation, and which was a blessing because um, dealing with projectors, projecting vertically is kind of a nightmare. Um, the other thing was the, the, you'll notice that there's these kind of boxes with wings on them, what we call the Iron Maidens, and that simplified how the workers would become soldiers. They would just basically go in there with some food, and they would come out as soldiers. Um, and another thing you'll notice is that the queen doesn't look so much like a Gary Larson cartoon anymore. She's much more sleek and menacing. But from a game design perspective, uh, the, she becomes a smaller target and a lot harder to hit. Our initial exhibition of Killer Queen Arcade was at the Come Out and Play Festival here in New York, which is a very important festival for Nick and I. We've debuted all four of our games there. And we really like that festival. It gives us a very clear deadline. It's local. We know the audience that will be there. And we're, we know the organizers well and the other games that we'll be pre uh, presented with. And so at that initial exhibition, the game, instead of an arcade cabinet, it was 
a, it was projected, and we had 12 NES controllers. And there was a lot of problems with the NES controllers. Even though we were happy with how the game was playing, the controllers were unreliable. We had to constantly unplug them and plug them back in. And when you did that, you'd change to a different player. Um, the all, all 12 cables would just turn into this enormous rat's nest that we were constantly untangling. It was almost impossible to know who else was on your team. And you couldn't tell who was the queen of your team. And then a couple months later, we had an opportunity to show it at the Hide and Seek Weekender in London, which was really a great moment for us. I think it was the first time that together we realized that there was something truly great about this game and that we needed to um, pursue it further. OK, so um, we were thinking about dedicated hardware, clearly, because the NES thing was kind of a nightmare. And we knew that having dedicated controls would eliminate many of the problems. So around this time, uh, Charles Pratt from NYU uh, Game Center, and also who is the curator of No Quarter, um, he offered something that was really interesting to us, which was to build a cabinet for No Quarter. And um, we were really excited about that idea. It was, it was a great opportunity to exhibit, exhibit the game. And there was a little bit of money, but really the most important thing was that uh, Charles believed in the game and believed in us, and that kind of drove us forward to say, yeah, let's do this. Let's, let's, let's make this giant cabinet that we've been talking about. So like everything that we did with the software, uh, we wanted to build the cabinet ourselves. And so we did that, and building it was really fun, but also really hard and very taxing. So the first step of building it was we sat down with Natalie Pozzi, who is an architect who has also done several game installations. And she gave us a lot of great advice, um, but it was also sort of a wake-up call for us as to how difficult building something physical like this was going to be. So we started researching the schematics of other arcade games that were kind of similar. Probably the two closest are Gauntlet and six-player X-Men. And so uh, we, you know, we looked at the schematics for those, and we noticed that, that they both had uh, flat control panels. And you'll notice Killer Queen also has a flat control panel instead of a normally uh, they have like a slightly angled control panel. And and the reason for that is you, it's impo it's almost impossible to get the ang to get angles for that are accurate for all the players around the cabinet. And another thing that those games had in common is the experience for the players on the outside was uh, suboptimal compared to the players in the middle. And so we uh, wanted to improve on what had already been done and make that experience as good as possible for, for the outer players in our game. So like the software projects that we create, we started with a paper prototype, and you, which you can see here. We actually built it out of cardboard. And uh, this uh, helped us learn how big the cabinet should be in order to accommodate five players on each side. It helped us figure out the height that the control panel should be at to feel comfortable for different types of players, which we also largely based off of the X-Men uh, cabinet as well. And it also helped us figure out the viewing angle to the TV. And also at this time, we experimented with a variety of uh, joysticks and buttons, which uh, you know we had to pick pick out which ones felt right for our, for our game specifically. Oh, so, and then the next thing that we did was we made a 3D model in Google SketchUp, which was very helpful in designing the look and feel of the game. And it helped us really plan out for, for building the actual cabinet and work out a lot of the kinks in advance uh, while we could do it um, and we, while we could make modifications easily. So to build the actual cabinet, we went upstate to Millbrook, New York, to where my parents and my brother live. And uh, we went there because uh, they have a lot of space and a lot of tools. And we don't have any of those in uh, Brooklyn. And um, also, my brother and father live there. And they gave us a lot of help building the cabinet and also taught us a lot about woodworking, which uh, was really interesting to learn and also very helpful with us. To, so to software guys like us, um, Building a physical object like this is such a foreign concept. Like <laughs> the idea of measuring uh, measuring twice and cutting once is completely counter uh, to the iterative design process that we normally use when we're making software. So, 
yeah, I, it w- so it was very difficult, uh, but we got through it, and uh, we're happy. We were very happy with the result, but it took a, lo- a lot of work and a long time. All right. So uh, building an arcade machine forced us to think about game design in a whole new way. Um, the game design definitely influenced uh, the design of the cabinet. But what we weren't expecting was that the inverse was also true. The, game des- the, the cabinet design also influenced the game design. So um, right off the bat, we had a problem with six versus six. It was just going to be too big. Uh, there was no way around it. So that led us to a five versus five game. The other thing that happened as a result of that was that now we had an odd number of seats, which was great because now we could put the queen in the center, which like highlighted her importance in the game. Okay, so the control panel was a major design consideration. And uh, we needed to do a couple of things. One, we needed very simple controls. Two, we needed to fit five players in the smallest space possible. And we needed to do that because all the players needed to be able to see the screen equally well. Uh, And, you know, for practical considerations, we wanted, you know, a smaller footprint. So what we did was, Uh, You'll notice that all the controls on the gold are further out to the edge, and all the controls on the white are further in. So they're basically what that what the result of that is that the player's shoulders become staggered instead of kind of going through each other like they did in the Google SketchUp model. Now they could do this. Uh, The other thing is, if you'll notice, the ones on the far outside. the angle of those controls is about five to seven degrees different than the ones on the inside. And so basically what that does is it makes the players turn their body a little bit, giving a little bit more space. Okay, Uh, you'll also notice there's no superfluous controls. So each player, each worker gets a two-way joystick and a jump button, and uh, the queen gets an eight-way joystick and a jump button. So after No Quarter, we had a lot of opportunities to demo the game, to exhibit it at festivals, play test it at events. And we wanted to take advantage of those opportunities, but we couldn't move the cabinet to all of these. And we were were reluctant to uh, revert back to the NES controller. So we built this, which we call our portable edition of the game. And um, it used the same uh, joysticks and buttons that the cabinet used, but it collapses to a size that's small enough to fit on a plane and use with a projector. And we, we used it to show the game at a, a lot of festivals, and we realized that people just people love it. We had, we had a great time. Players had a great time. We also had a lot of difficulty with exhibiting it. There's the, the organizers of events had a hard time figuring out how to fit it in with the rest of the games that were being shown. It's, it's very large and um, unlike anything else. The, um, so the size was a problem, and uh, also jurying it was, was very hard. Like for, for IGF, the judges who weren't in New York or San Francisco, we had to mail them NES controllers, even though we knew that was a suboptimal experience. And um, also maintaining it at extended exhibitions, like here, is a lot of work. We're here at least every couple weeks making some little change, um, like repairing a wheel or doing a software update. And, but I think it's important, and, you know, so we, we make sure that we do that. Another example of sort of the confusion that happen, ha- happens with a game that's so different is that, like, at Indicate this year, we had a great time, but one of the problems was the game was put outside. And so uh, we had to build this ridiculous fortress around it to, sh- to shield it from the sun. Um, and even still, we were plagued by glare. And also... For some reason, we were included in the big games and tabletop section. And the only reason I can think of is it is a very big game, and technically, it includes a tabletop. (laughs) All right, so a big part of the Killer Queen experience is the monthly tournaments. And uh, this is a great opportunity for us to market the game, but it's also a great opportunity to try out new ideas, get feedback from players, And uh, it also gives the players a chance to introduce the game to their friends in a very social kind of event. Um, 
and we tried to mix it up. We tried to do something a little bit different every time, and we figured out some things that work for a game like this for tournaments. Uh, basically, you want a large screen so that uh, spectators can watch the game, and spectators are really important. Um, you want no or very few distractions. Okay, so the first time that we ran the tournament here at Museum of Moving Image, it was a little bit of a mess. The, uh, we ran it in the exhibition space. There were 24 other games that it was competing with, uh, plus another tournament that we were competing for players with. And so um, we didn't get the same kind of energy that we usually do. Uh, so in the next version, we moved it to the middle floor where that little auditorium is, the second floor where the little auditorium is, and um, and that went a lot better, and we also staggered the tournament between us and Slashdash so that we were never competing for players. Another really important part is casters. So we had the opportunity to have Eric Zimmerman and Charles Pratt cast at one of our tournaments, and it was great. It raised the excitement, but it also raised the understanding of the game among the spectators. So here's a video. And, and took out every single one of the Blue Soldiers. And now Gold is in a commanding position. A commanding position. Right. The only, the only thing that might happen is a Blue Snail victory, but it's looking unlikely at yeah, this point. Yeah. Uh, again, well, they're, they're, fighting back for, uh, they're fighting back for the main Gold, is, really Gold is converting those mains again. And right. again, we see a repeat of last game where the early blue, blue military victory. Yeah, blue is down to their last queen. They, she cannot die again. And there we go. She gets lured into the city and taken out by a gold soldier. A sweep. A sweep from I puke. Took. Six in a row. Charles is very excited. Uh, all right. God bless him. <laughs> um, OK, so one of the things that we want to do in the future is build a turnkey solution into the cabinets. So when our arcade owner buys the machine, they can run tournaments very easily. The, the software would just basically handle the streaming to Twitch. It would handle managing the teams and the brackets. So after Indicade, we, uh, we wanted to start building more cabinets ourselves. And we started investigating how to do that in a practical manner. And we found some solutions, but we were at the same time we were approached by this firm from Wisconsin called Fun Company. And they build all the cabinets for Namco and a lot of the other big players. And we realized after talking to them that they could build the cabinet for roughly the same cost it would cost us to do it ourselves. And it would be higher quality and a lot less work for us. And so we started working with them to build the second iteration of the cabinet, which is what you see upstairs here at the museum. And they helped us balance our vision of the game with the practical constraints of, of manufacturing, and uh, including costs, the uh, building something that's reliable and sturdy, and something that can be secure enough to be in a public space. And also managing practical matters of working with arcades, like fitting through a 30-inch door. <laughs> and we've learned that the arcade business is very, very different than the downloadable video game business that we're used to uh, most of the time. And there's a lot of challenges specific to arcades and even more specific with our game because it's so large. So one thing that we've learned is that arcade owners tend to fill all of their, fo their floor space because the more games that they have out there, the more money they, they can make. So in order to, to take a chance on this unknown newcomer like us, they have to displace other arcade games to make room for it. And in, in our case, because it's so big, that's about four normal-sized arcade games. So uh, you know that's just a real challenge to get arcade owners to want to do that. And then another problem is that the, arca the arcade uh, model is built around a single-player model, not a team-based model. So even multiplayer games like Street Fighter, they rely on us, each player putting in their own quarter, and then you keep playing until you've been defeated. And so there's no precedent set for that, and we're really struggling for how to make it clear that it's a team game and figuring out who pays for the game and if there's a reward for winning or uh, you know how that all works. And we're experimenting, and some things are working, some are not. OK, so one of the great things about working on this project was we met this guy, Panos Kutsoyanis. And he's a really intense, interesting kind of guy. He has over 300 classic local multiplayer arcade games in some warehouse in the desert. And uh, he was the one who basically saw the potential in Killer Queen as a commercial product. And he, 
encouraged us to do a bunch of monetization tests. So he kind of gave us an education in the economics of selling arcade cabinets, which is, the formula goes, uh, you sell it at the cost of how much it can reasonably make in a year. So if you do your monetization tests and you can prove to an arcade owner that it's going to make $10,000, you can sell it for $10,000. Uh, so with that in mind, we basically have started to do some tests at this place called QZAR, which is kind of a combination of laser tag and Chuck E. Cheese right outside of San Francisco. So this is very early data. It's not conclusive at all, but we wanted to share it with you. It's only been there for three weeks so far. And um, for those three weeks, the first two weeks, it was set at $2.50 a game. That's for all 10 players to play. And it made about $40 each week. Then last week, we set it to a dollar game, and it, the sales uh, doubled to about $80 a week. Um, and this weekend, we, just yesterday, we set it to 50 cents a game. And we don't have any data back yet, but we're really curious to see how that pans out. So, uh, and we want to share that with you, you know, once we have it. And so just sort of as a metric to compare this against it, the same location, House of the Dead 4, which is an average performing arcade game for them, uh, earns about $80 in the same time frame in one in one week <laughs> well but so uh, which actually uh, we feel is may not that good considering our game is newer and about twice as large as the game so yeah so we're we're, we're basically struggling with the idea now of like why are we competing with House of the Dead 4 right <laughs> and so like our game has this very minimalist retro aesthetic you know and that's awesome in a barcade which is a potential market for us and we're excited to explore that. But with kids, they look at it and they're like, well, why doesn't it look like these games, right? Um, so that's a problem. And then due to the size, the owner can only afford to put it in a crappy location in the arcade. It's like sitting by the bathrooms and you basically have to look for it to find it. And uh, kids don't understand the paradigm like Josh was talking about before. Uh, there's no single player mode so we're basically changing the paradigm. We're, we're, we're taking a paradigm of air, air hockey and trying to apply it to video games. So that's a problem that we're struggling with right now. Uh, the other thing is redemption tickets, right? So we're, we're not the only ones competing with redemption tickets. All video games in arcades now are competing with redemption tickets. They're basically slot machines for kids. And uh, they have these 15 second experiences and then they get these tickets and then they trade them in for trinkets. And arcade owners love redemption machines because, okay, so at the same location, a typical redemption machine will make $200 in a week. Uh, so one of the things that we're experimenting with and trying out is, well, what if we put a ticket dispenser on Killer Queen? And so we get a lot of funny looks from the owner and our operator. And, but when we ask them, well, why is that a bad idea? Why isn't every arcade game doing that? They're like, because that's not how it's done. Uh, so this slide shows the number of games that have been played right here in the museum over uh, basically the last two weeks. You'll notice the weekends are the most popular, and then they're closed on Mondays and Tuesdays, and then it ramps up for the weekend again. So this is exciting to us because if we could get this amount of play in an arcade, um, even at a dollar a game, that would be about $20,000 a year per cabinet. And so we've been spending a lot of time on the business lately uh, thinking about you know, how we can build more cabinets to get this game out to more people. Um, but we're also starting to think about our next collaboration. We want to do another local multiplayer game, probably an arcade game. We're thinking about maybe experimenting with some unique controls like trackballs or something like that. And we've also been thinking about the new arcade and how uh, we would like to curate it or see other people curate it in a different way than, has, than is being done right now. So our next tournament is here at the museum on February 28th um, at 6 p.m., maybe 7 p.m. Um, and uh, we hope you guys can come, and thanks for coming to our talk. Thank you. So we got time for two questions. Uh, I'm not picking. Yeah. 
So, I guess in the New York area, what are your favorite arcades and why? Okay, can I feel this? Sure. Uh, so, it used to be Playland, uh, but unfortunately, thank you, Rudy Giuliani, Playland does no longer exists. Uh, and then it became Chinatown Fair, and that was awesome, but then they closed. And now they're next level, which I haven't been to, even though it's pretty close to my house. Um, I don't know. Uh, I like Barcade, but not for the games. I like the beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Barcade isn't really... Too. Yeah, Barcade is not really about the games. That's the problem. And I love Barcade, too, actually. It's probably my favorite. Anybody? How did you test a 10-person arcade game with, like, two people on your team? Uh, you well, yeah, we, I mean, we would invite people over to Nick's office. Uh, a lot of times we, we would get uh, his team from, like, the other games that he's working on. They would help us, and, we would we, yeah, we'd just invite people over. And one of the things that was really difficult with this game was, was that, was getting 10 people together. And so we would really try and take advantage of those situations. So we'd play a game, and then say, okay, what changes should we make? And then on the fly, I'd be there changing the code while everybody's watching me code on the, on the big projection, which was really intense and a lot of pressure on me. And my code, <laughs> because we did this thing so quick, the code was terrible. And I, I, I was, was expecting that code yeah. last <laughs> night, and it was how horrible. <laughs> it, was, it was basically like a code review in front of you know, all these players. And so, yeah, we, we would make those changes on the fly and just iterate and iterate and iterate as, as much as possible. But also, it really helped that we had this the non-digital version the field game to work out sort of the the larger uh rules of, of the game and i think also ibeam and nyu game center were really great sources for us to find players and uh experiment with new things well thank you